Okay. Hello, Renee. How are you? Fine, thanks. And how are you today, Deborah? I'm doing great. Thank you for being one of our playwrights in the Frozen Women anthology. I'm really so glad to have you. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. Yeah. Yay. So this is just an introductory little meetup. And our first question is, what called you to become a playwright? Well, I'm not sure that I, yes, I was definitely called. What happened was I started out as an actor. Okay. And as many actors do when they go into the profession, it was children's theater that mm -hmm. I was auditioning for. And I had gone to school with the director of this, um, and it was an equity children's uh, company. And he said, Renee, I need a play on the War of 1812. Wow. Which you don't consider a war between Canada and the U.S. since you seem to consider it with Britain, but we consider it a war between Canada and the U.S. So the thing was, he said, Renee, I need this play. And if you write it for me and give yourself a part, then you, you'll you get to be in the play. <laughs> and then he I said, see. And, uh, because it's a, it's a historical thing, you know, I can get grants, so I will pay you uh, to be the, both the playwright and the actor in the part that you write for yourself. And then I had to sign a waiver stating that as an the actor in my own play, I would not interfere with any of the director's decisions. Ooh. Because you know, as a playwright, you you think, well, that, that's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah, no. So anyway, that's that's how it happened. And then I'm, so I made this jump into an equity production because up to then I'd been non-equity into this children's show as the playwright and an actor. And I did write a play that Oh, he did say, you write a play that no one else can do, Renee, and I'll cast you in it. So, ah. so I wrote a play. So in the play, there was a role for a young French Canadian girl who, uh, you know, could sing. So that made, they, you know, being a bilingual meant it gave me that little edge. And so, yeah, so I wrote the part for me. I gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. So you would say you began as an actor then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and interestingly enough, as an actor, um, I was an, in a, I was at a unit, the University of Windsor, which is just across from Detroit. I've always been sort of a border town girl. I've always been on the border. And uh, an American director came up to do a show called uh, The Rhymers of Eldridge. I think Lamford Wilson. Okay. In, yeah. In any case, um, this director said to me, you know, you're 20 years old, you're, you're young, you're one, there's an awful lot of women out there trying to get parts just like you. Right. He said, but you can speak French. So you don't have to train here. You don't have to keep staying here. You don't have to train in Canada or America said, go to France, go to one of the great schools in France, expand your horizons. Wow. So, that, so that's what I did. And in transitioning there, going to the school that I studied in France, it was a physical theater school. So it focused on the total opposite of being a playwright. It, it focused on body language and the physicality of body language. Um, and Which how is that? What method? Ecole Jacques Lecoq. There you go. That would have yeah. been my guess. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there it was. And that was a wonderful experience. But it did open up your whole world, you know, when you're 21 years old and you're performing scenes and you're both speaking a different language, but you know exact, you know what they're saying. And anyhow. So so that was the beginning of a transition because then I I sort of as an actor, I was able to get a fair bit of commercial work because I would do mime stuff. Ah, so I would do all this stuff, and there weren't a lot of female mimes, but it would would suddenly in vogue. So wow. it, it was my bread and butter for a little while, and then and then from that, and it's mime is nice because it's solo work. So if you have an injury or something, you you can favor it, and you don't have to worry about your partner. And right, you're free. Yeah, exactly. So I did that for the, I did the mime and then um, it just was a natural thing that I went into choreography. Okay. And then they, 
in shows they want to diminish or demean, uh, lower the costs. So many sh musical shows would be director choreographer. So then oh. I was a director choreographer. And then from there I would start directing. And then, you know, I was just, I wanted more me time. I wanted more quiet time. I wanted more thinking time. I, and direct, once you get in directing, they're very short term gigs, mm. you know, you're, because the actors have a long run, but you're done. Right. And I thought, no, I want something that's going to sustain me. And, and then I had, along the way, I'd already been hired as this playwright in my very early acting years. Right. And okay. Started, you know, I knew a few playwrights from being in the business as a choreographer director. And uh, we got, I got together and I founded a, a playwrights group. Okay and resurrected what had been the start of the career 20 years earlier. And so I founded Playwrights Niagara in 2012, and uh, it wow. left in 2021 only because I moved. I gave up my position and I moved, and it's it's still going strong. Uh, and it's, it, it exists solely for, play, for professional playwrights for their development and internal readings and that kind of thing that I tried to start one up in the north here, but I'm, I'm right at the um, against the upper northern shore of Lake Superior. That's where I live. Okay. Uh, right across from Sioux, Michigan. There's Sioux, Michigan and Sioux St. Marie, Canada. So uh, I think I've lost track of what was I saying? Yeah, just you tried to relocate. You left your one. Oh writing yeah, I tried to start a group. I start, start. I tried to start a new group up here, and unfortunately, and I went through the the Playwrights Guild, which is our version of the Playwrights Union, because we don't have a union anymore. They can't use that word. It's called guild. So right. I went through the Playwrights Guild. I said, "Who are the professional playwrights up here?" And they said, "Within a three-hour drive, there's one." So her and I meet regularly, but that well, is the good. extent of our collaboration. So groups like yours are so incredibly significant because people in rural areas like myself who are writing and have, you know, little to no people who are professional colleagues uh because there is no you know if you're really rural there's no professional theater there's community theater but there's no real professional theater out there so it's very 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 important to have companies out there like yours that are promoting culture and particularly feminine culture because we know how much this is still dominated by men the plays are male dominant i make a point of always trying to have more women in my plays than men because it makes no sense the market is is more female dominated why is the higher why does the market not address that you know yeah it's up to yeah. you and me and all these smaller companies to change that to yeah promote the thoughts of women and uh who we are and what we are, especially we're the majority of the population. I think we're 51 or 52 percent. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, tell us about your monologue. This is a really special piece, I can tell. Well, yeah. Um, my it is, the piece is about uh, the mother of my daughter-in-law. Uh, and this is called Kim's story. We should this say this is time. Kim's story. So when you do a monologue that's based, I discovered um i discovered that when you do a monologue based on veracity and truth and it has to be true and everybody who knows anything is still alive you really got to get your facts right yeah what started off as an uh it's just a, a nice idea when i read the there were just a couple lines about kim in and her funeral bulletin you know how you get those little pat whether it's called a celebration of life or funeral just her obituary and in that obituary it just mentioned two lines about how she had she had been imprisoned and had to carry her children through the jungle and i thought whoa 
you know, I, I, we share the same grandchildren and I never knew this. Wow. So, I never knew that part of it because she really didn't speak English. So, you know, we spoke a little bit to one another in French, but uh, so I didn't know her story at all. I just knew her as my son's mother-in-law. Uh, although our families lived fairly close together and my husband taught her son. So, oh, wow. <laughs> and so there were connections, there were connections there, but that gave me the idea at her funeral. When I read these couple lines, I thought, well, that's an interesting story. And everybody's all these immigrants, they do have complicated stories yeah. and they're much in a much bigger world than you and I are. So, yeah. I started to pursue it and it was initially started, it initially started as two monologues. Okay. One of a Zen, uh, Generation Z, -er, you know, with her nanny and her tying her shoes and all the, you know, things and not really very punctual about her work ethics and all that. Just running and stopping to um, tie her shoes beside Kim sitting on a bench. And then I had each of them tell their stories, but nobody really cared about the generation Z. Well, we went into discussion about it in the playwrights group and development. And they said, you should just tell, the suggestion was to just tell Kim's story. Right. Because that was the really interesting one, as opposed to trying to do a comparative study. Uh, so I did, but it, you know, having to get everything, there were several versions of it before I got, everybody in the family could decide which were the closest facts and who was, why did we say that? And right. It was definitely a community thing. And I was still trying to capture the fact that that language wasn't too smooth, you know, so that anybody with an accent can do it. And then there were no words that were too big, but it yeah. might be had she been able to speak English, what she would say. Uh, and I, I think so. I mean, luckily, my daughter-in-law you know, lives very close by now. So she has reread and re before it went into you, I <laughs> the final version that went into you <laughs> was redacted and reenacted and replayed. <laughs> got it. I'm pretty sure we got it just right. <laughs> Good, good, good. I know what was interesting for me in receiving submissions, and this is how it would go for my producing four plays a year. I got into this habit of just blind reading everything that came at me and kind of using it as a way to take a temperature of the culture in terms of what it meant to be a woman, especially. And, and I usually could always choose four plays that resonated off of one another in, in unexpected ways, you know, and that would lead me to title the whole year based on, so it was like tapping into some kind of weird collective unconscious um, in right. the play submission. And because we're so small, I would choose the plays I would announce in February and go straight into rehearsal. So there wasn't like a year that went by through a committee or anything like that. It was like, you know, and one of the things, and me, myself as a, a playwright, have spent a decade on the Molly Maguires. So I know for sure that when you're telling historical stories about women, it's very tricky and you don't want to write a Wikipedia page about them. You want mm -hmm. it to be a dynamic something mm -hmm. about the character. So you have to take liberties, mm -hmm. um, but then there's this reverence and you don't want to take too many liberties. And it's such a weird line. It and is. I, it is. Yeah. And I found that like the more liberties I took, the closer I got to them, which was mm -hmm. so interesting. But in this submission process, instead of only selecting four plays, I was able to select 76, you know? Yes. And a similar thing of like, the chapters then started to reveal themselves to me. Like, I'm going to, this is how, as a producer, this is how I view it, you know, and not um, being ruled by the canon of like, well, chapter one should be, you know, yeah. it's like, no, I, and so one chapter that revealed itself to me was biography. And I thought, this is really amazing because I do get a lot of submissions of biographical characters. And I, a lot of times can't produce them. Um, just because there aren't enough roles for, in them or for whatever reason. 
Um, but this was an opportunity to really run with it and give them a place to live. Yes. And so yes. it's so amazing just to have this biography chapter, all kinds of different women and yours, obviously, you know, one of them and so i just applaud you and thank you because it's it's not like any other process writing a biographical it's not like anything no. else and as a woman in particular because a male biography is you you have the canon you have the um all of the assumed knowns like we we live in that world so we know we we jump in with a bunch of assumptions there's a familiarity to the world but when you're writing a female biography you have to explain every like the territory everything none mm -hmm. none of it is known no you know? that's right yes so it's the i understand what that challenge is and i just tip my hat to you i was i was so excited to read it and the reverence that's in it i i i felt that i understand that you know so so well, how, like many, oh i'm sorry i was just gonna no, say no, just, no. just like many immigrants um you don't know there's they're, they're often very quiet people yeah uh, partly it's a language thing and and a hesitancy thing because you're not part of the culture and a learning experience for them but they have stories like incredible background stories and yet you know we we dismiss them or we look at them or we don't understand them or they're just too right. quiet to be part of the conversation and that it's it's amazing. I'm, I'm I'm thrilled that you're actually doing a whole section of looking at the internal mechanisms within the whole biography. How many biographies are you including? Um, I'll tell you right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Where are my biographies? This used to be very organized. Oh. <laughs> oh. Eleven. Wow. Okay. Eleven yeah okay. and how many submissions did you have overall deborah over 300. wow wow yeah and i heard the funding's coming along really well yeah the funding is great uh we we're still have the uh the gofundme in place um but we have everything we need for a publication all the money now is just going to be to make sure i get a hard copy to you and things in admin cost or whatever but it, to pay palmetto we we've got it covered so that's huge it's such a big relief right yeah. so oh yeah so there'll be nice hard that's amazing nice hard cover it's a hard cover copy these days is priceless yeah I, I i wanted to use palmetto because they rank top with a better business bureau mm -hmm. my watch is vibrating i'm sorry and um and they won a torch award for ethics and i thought i i like this and they they do all of the marketing they do all the press releases they have all the contacts which was a big relief to me mm -hmm. and they said you could do it all digital but hard copy still sells more than digital which shocked me i didn't realize but books are still selling apparently yeah well they're just they're just more accessible Absolutely. really you can't exact you can't take your laptop everywhere and or, you like sometimes you have to scribble in the margins and feel the yes. pages exactly yes yeah, like question marks <laughs> yeah yeah. I think we kind of covered your process. It sounds like it was an interviewing kind of process with the whole family. Yeah, yeah. And well, yeah. and they would go away, they would read, and then they'd go away, and then they'd say, oh, she has to put this in. And then I have That's to go great. back, and they'd say, and, and you know, there were things that very specifically that they, they wanted left out. Sure you know uh yeah and uh, i had to agree to that and, and leaving to my mind theatrically and dramatically they made this story a little less interesting leaving them out but i left them out because that's you know it was their story her yeah. story yeah so i wanted to follow their wishes and you know i i didn't want to have to pull it from the shelves because i said something wrong yeah I know yeah. one of the characters in my piece, Margaret O'Donnell, she um, never spoke English. She only spoke Highland Gaelic. And what I, from what I read, it was a, a choice. Like she didn't want to speak English. And when you say that, it sort of reminds me like, it, there was also the theme of like dying proud. Like there's this sense of like, we won't be defined by the terrible things that happen to us. We're mm -hmm. going to carry ourselves with pride. We're going to carry ourselves with dignity in our own language. Like there's a, 
I don't know, reverence, respect for that, you know, yeah. but as a, as a theatron though, you know, that it would be more dynamic if we saw the, yeah, yes. but <laughs> it's, it's just like, but there's a, that's what I guess I mean about biographies, why it can mm -hmm. be very difficult to stage them in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was, yeah. But, I'm so yeah. Excited. Monologues are a great way to do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So what has your experience been regarding play development? You already talked about writing yourself into plays. I assume this was earlier on in your career. <laughs> that was the only time that ever happened, but okay. <laughs> and, and it was only because <laughs> Yeah, that's how it came about. That was my first foray and in my into playwriting, like I said, and then I didn't go back to it for 20 years. But oh, OK, um, yes. So okay. I, I don't know about the about the process and development. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And, you know, one of the things is one of the hardest things is is the end result when you finally are where you want to be. And you want to get it on stage because uh, you've done your readings, you know, you've brought together, yeah. you've worked in your playwrights group, you've discussed everything. Now I'll, uh, you bring together friends, you have a play reading. Now, how do you get it up there? And, and that is still in the process for me, one of the most difficult things. A, if you write, I find, and maybe other people haven't found the same thing, but if you write a full length play, it doesn't get read you know i think directors are just so busy and even though they have a call out for full-length plays if they don't know your work they don't read it so you get into the thing habit of writing smaller plays one act plays 10 minute mm -hmm. plays and that yeah. kind of thing hoping they'll get selected but because they can be written quicker you're in a huge competitive pool right so, I suppose, and I was thinking about this before I, I spoke with you today. Uh, I keep a list when my uh, where my plays are sent. So because I have several, and I don't always remember which play went where. So if someone writes me back, so I keep a list, an annual list of how many times I send in submissions, and I'd say that list ranges between thirty to thirty-five every year. Okay. And positive responses are about two. They average two a year. Yeah. And so I don't know if other people, if I'm really lucky, maybe I have two and one that made it to the finals or something. But it's that part. It, and that's the frustrating part because you know you have something yeah. good and you're trying to get it out there and you're trying to get someone to read it. Um, so that's my experience with the process. Play, uh, places like yours are wonderful because they really help with the development. And sometimes they help with that very first step on getting on stage. And then yeah. from there, it's a little bit easier to watch the play grow and get published and on all the rest. But you need that, you know, you need those first steps to happen. And places theaters like yours are and, and especially targeted towards women's development of women's plays and women's thoughts uh, they're 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 so significant in our theater world so i thank you deborah That's oh I, and thank you and i've i've said this before so I, i'm repeating myself but i don't know if it brings you any comfort to know that you are in no way alone uh, i almost all of these sessions when i've asked these questions the same thing comes up of a writer's group. I belong to a writer's group. I started a writer's group. There's an mm -hmm. informal group of us that gather. So I, I'm getting that, because my perception as a producer and director in particular of playwrights is that they're the gods of their own worlds. And so that's really interesting to be, in a, be by yourself in a room and create this whole world where you decide who lives, who dies, what they wear, how they speak, everything. And then say, okay, I release it all of it i mean it's just like such an act of just faith and trust you know to put it out in the universe after it's been born of your brain you know so mm -hmm. the feedback that i've been getting is like yes we we gather we gather we give each other feedback and and they mm -hmm. say we get to be actors you know we get to read each other's roles and we have fun and yeah that's exactly right yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that seems to be pretty consistent mm -hmm. and then your frustration i is also shared you know 
for sure. And I can tell you from the perspective of Venus, uh, when we did a play by Carolyn Gage called Ugly Ducklings, it was about um, an, att <clears throat> an attempted suicide of an eight-year-old at a girls' summer camp. And Carolyn and I talked about it in session three or two or something. And um, the play was older than most of the actors when I produced it. She had submitted it, submitted it, I think for 18 years. Mm -hmm. No one would touch it or produce it. So by the time we produced it, the play was older than most of the actors. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then Pat Lynn, too, you know, for Zelda at the Oasis, she had been commissioned to write about the Fitzgeralds, but she focused on Zelda instead of F. Scott. And ah, okay. So they were like, yeah, so it never got produced. And mm -hmm. she just saw our call and happened to have it already sealed in an envelope and stamped. So she just dropped it in the mail by midnight to meet the deadline. And I was like, oh my God. And that was a 13 year old script that had never been produced. So when I hear professionals say that there are no plays written by women, I just think, they couldn't be more negligent. I mean, it's not hard to put out a call. It's not right. hard, you know, as Alana said, you just, you just do it. it, it all of this, it's so hard to get women there. It's not hard, you just do it. Stop complaining mm -hmm. and do it. So I think we all share your frustrations and, um, and, and encourage you to keep, keep on writing, you know? Right. It's, it's that, and, initial idea and spark that you're always looking for to push you you know because yes. you're like well i need to write about something but what is it i want to write about it because you have to really feel it to yeah you, you delve, delve into it and that's just, and it's a great feeling when you finish finish your play and then your next thought is oh but what am i going to write about next you know <laughs> i love the relationships writers have with themselves like to be able to dance in your own world. Like, do you have um, a process where you write at a certain time of day or have a certain kind of ritual or does it come at you at unexpected times? Like how does the muse come through you? It happens when I'm trying to fall asleep. Yeah. I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm going, oh, I forgot, the oh, you know, this would be great. And, and it was always the same as it, when I was directing. You know, uh, I would say that's what that character has to do. And then do the same as a playwright, you know, and then the yeah. things get changed. But sometimes I have these brilliant ideas. I don't write them down. And in the morning, I only remember half of them or a quarter it's of them. On, right? Yeah. So Some poet, I can't remember who, said it was like trying to catch the tail of a kite. You know, when she wrote poetry, she would see the kite and she would have to run through the field and try to catch the tail. And that was the poem that was like, oh, she just tried to catch it before it flew away. You know, I think that's a really, really colorful and excellent analogy. Yeah, mm -hmm. for I sure. I remember who said it. Oh, oh well, me. Oh. that's OK. I think you've read a lot of playwrights, so. Yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And they, they, they don't know that I read everything. And so those people who submit the same plays year after year, I'm like, I read it already. I read it already. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Well, you see, I think probably their whole, they, they think it's going to fall within a committee. And maybe right. another one on the committee will read it. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. I'm the committee. That's a lot of reading, Deborah. It is. Yeah. It is. It's ritualistic. I. It's usually like November, December, where I just go into the, I like to go into the cave and like, just mm -hmm. like get my right cup of coffee or hot chocolate and just, just read for two months, just really saturate myself. And that way, I, like I said, I can see what's resonating one thing to the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then sometimes I'll share it. Like, can you read this for me? I, you know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. my whole team seems to really trust me. They think I have a gift. They're like, you're like the play whisperer. You know what's going to work. Just <laughs> Yeah. So it's well, nice. I, I'd say, I mean, you've been around, what, for 10 years or something? It'll be 25. Um, 25. Well, it's I think you've proven 35. your worth, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Venus was founded in 2000. But then before that, I ran a company called Venus Envy which was um, an interactive improv troupe for women. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so it goes way back. It goes way back. Oh, but, wow, wow. Yeah, it's so weird. It's weird when time goes by and like 
Oh, I, I just woke up this morning saying Venus is about to turn 25 years old. The nonprofit <laughs> is about to, you know, it took them a year to get the paperwork through, but still I say yeah. 25 years old and that's a long time in this industry. It cert oh, it certainly is. It certainly is. And and you've been making pathways. I mean, bit by bit, you know, we see a few more women nominated for a few more awards in theater and but it's it's companies like yours that keep pushing things forward and making things happen. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird to lose the space because we've had the same space for 15 years. Oh. So we were nomadic 10 years before that. Um, so when we lost the space, people thought we went away. And I said, no, we were nomadic <laughs> before that. Like, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was nice to have a space for 15 years. Um, and it took some real um, deep diving to figure out what, and that's how it led to publishing. I thought, mm -hmm. well, now I, I, we can publish and it can be, it can happen everywhere now. You know? Yes, yes, it's great. I mean, and, and as far as I know, you're the only one around for female works, right? Well, there's um, the Women's Project in New York City. Okay. okay. So um, I know that. And there used to be some smaller companies. I think they're, it's hard to say, like I say we're the longest running regional women's theater in the U.S., but that's because that's what my playwrights have told me. Like, Deb, I've been submitting. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm like, okay, I'll take, but it's not like there's a good study on it or something. It's not like <laughs> no, nobody cares about us to keep track. You know, nobody did their thesis on it or anything on the a pathway of women's theater in America. Yeah. Yeah. I've had people audition going, I, I, I wrote my thesis on your company and I was like, I've never met you. That's so strange. <laughs> but uh, yeah, our little storefront only sat 40 people, very modest. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and you lost it. It was a during COVID. It yeah. was, it was, um, yes, it was. Absolutely. But it was also my landlord lost his mind and tried to raise our rent 20% um, no. during no. COVID. And uh, it just misogyny suddenly surrounded us. It was so odd. It was just time to go. And mm -hmm. uh, I kept fighting it because that's what I do. I fight, you know, and then it was like, you know what? It is. It's just time to go. <laughs> and it, it shocked them. It really, I think they thought we were an installation, you know, we're mm -hmm. on, in, we're in Laurel, Maryland, and we're a, a tile on the Laurelopoly board game for the town. Like, you're yeah. here. It's like, well, you have to take care of us. You can't just price us out of the market. Like, yeah. 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 Well, you know, that's an interesting offshoot, I think, to go into publishing. I mean, then it kind of is solidifying, in a way, the work that you've been doing over the years and actually producing a, a tangible record of the kind of work that you produce. So uh, yeah, I think it, I think it was a very, it was, seems like a really interesting, challenging, but great decision to go into publishing on behalf of women's work. I feel really good about it. it my whole team for 10 years have been telling me to write my story, to write my memoir. And for a while, I'm like too young. I'm too young to have him like, no, no, I'm not really too young to do that. Um, and then I tried for 10 years I and I go, okay, this is it. And they would say, that's not it. That's not, can you please keep writing? And I'm like, ah, oh. so for the past year and a half, it's just been my job to like write. And it's been a non-linear, I'm sure you know this, it's a non-linear experience. It's not like you get a job and then you know you're usually working five jobs at once and spinning plates and you know yeah so how do you make that you know so i i really threw six drafts and i think around draft three i thought this is all about my love for the living playwright this is what yeah. it really is like venus wouldn't exist without the living playwright and i just have an awe for the fact that you walk among us you know and i thought this, we should also do an anthology, not just my story, because this isn't just my story. This is our story, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. that's how it came about. And so both books will be published at once. So yeah, I'm terrified. I, I think, I don't know what people are going to think about my story. It's definitely not a traditional path. And uh, I'm definitely a, like a poster girl of surviving everything. And um, so my team thinks my story will help people. So 
Wow. What are you, what's it called, your story? It, it's what? actually called Venus, lower V-E-N, capital U-S, uh, the veneration of us. Oh, okay. All right. And it's coming out at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm, you'll be just like a playwright right, waiting for the reviews when the show opens. Yeah. I, <laughs> and then I not do. wanting to read them and then telling everybody you don't care, you don't want to know. Or, don't read the reviews. Or don't read it to me unless it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like you're all together, you know, you've got each other. I, uh, Hopefully, I'm, 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 I've got you guys too. We all have each oh, other. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We got your back. Yeah. Yeah. I love. Well, Alana said that you know we love conflict. I mean, that's what plays are driven by conflict, right? So, mm, yeah. so I feel like the anthology captures different points of views as it should. It's not this mm -hmm. like directory of this is how you should absolutely feel about one thing. It's it's really a celebration of a lot of different voices who experience different things in different ways, you know? And yeah, yeah. To me, that's the beauty of it, right? Well, tell me, so tell me about, is it Laurel, Maryland that you're in? Yeah, yeah. How big is that population to, that it supports women? No, it's not very big. We, we're we sort of right on the Eastern seaboard. So Laurel is halfway between Washington, DC and Baltimore. Oh, so okay. I, I produced in Washington and Baltimore and then Pennsylvania, five states um, mm -hmm. for a mm -hmm. while nomadically. And then Laurel just is where I ended up living. Um, and so it sort of made sense to move here um, at the time. And now it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So I think everything's in shift with theater. So it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, I was wondering, um, will there be something that you digitally that you could send us that we can put on our own websites or Facebook pages or anything to promote the book? To promote yeah, absolutely. It? Yes. Um, um, I think that would be a great. Like if you if you have some kind of a, a little flyer or press release that we could just put out on. Yeah, our, that's what Palmetto is doing. Like that's their thing. And they have right now five descriptives of it that I love. One is going to become the subtitle. And um, so I'll, I'm meeting with my team at noon today and we'll definitely work on putting that together. I didn't want to jump the gun because we're actually paying them to do it. So yeah. I didn't want to come up with something and then say, oh no, let's do it this way instead. So no, no, I just went, you know, come summertime when it's close yes. to the release that if all of us, we all do blanket emails to all our friends and colleagues for the Absolutely. promotion. Yeah. That, and I'm just thinking, because we do that sometimes with posters, you know, everybody sends the little uh, postcard. The little yeah. Postcard. Yeah. But like digitally. Digitally, yeah, we do have a, we do have a store open open now with some we've got a bathing suit and some bags and stuff like that. Um, but we're just playing around with design ideas right now, and yeah, I think yeah. that over the next month we should be able to get something. Well, well it's yeah, it's early days still for for yeah, well, not for you because you're busy and you have a deadline. But <laughs> well, I met my deadline. Now I just have to deal with the. Uh, with the team and the editors and everybody and yeah. the, just the very formalized categories and this is how it's going to be ranked and this is in this cat so yeah it's well, all this very, whole new direction for you is energizing you just watching you talk so. about it you're energized and enthusiastic and it's a new direction and a new avenue for you so uh yeah it's uh Fingers crossed. I'm so glad you're in it. I'm so glad you're a part of it. And I'm so glad to have met you. Yeah, well, it's a it's a great experience. Yes. And then, well, it's almost international, isn't it? It is. It, actually, it is. Um, we've got Australian playwrights. We've got Oxford. We've got um, down, down. Yeah, it is international, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So that makes it even more. It's all women around the world joining together to have their voices men. heard right i think there are three male playwrights i think oh there are three okay i think oh. i i do read blind so i'm like oh i like these characters oh i like this well there's a play of mine going on right now well that opens in may called road trip and it's uh six women and one man and we've had to replace the man ah uh. <laughs> Got a little intimidated, I think. He was a, a young man, yeah. And, and, but it's, uh, 
I, I like to write plays that have more women than men. It's just, yeah. we, we've got to start balancing it out now. I've only ever staged one play with as many men as women. Otherwise, the women always outnumber the men on my stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah. was to make a point at a racetrack. Um, yeah, but and when you get them, you have to find the right guys for sure. Yeah. 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 And my guys, I, I'm i just, they're, they're so supportive. And mm -hmm. yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. I think they found they, the replacement guy knew what he was in for and he, he'll be great. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not yeah. too concerned, but. It, it was funny. It was just, it just seems so hard up here to, for them to cast a male uh, that wanted to be in a cast of six females. It, it yeah. was just, just something different. I new to me. You flip the gender and it's not a big deal. Like any woman would be like, thank God I have a role. There's only one woman with all these men. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Flip that around yeah. and it's like, what? Yes. <laughs> I know I've seen it many times. All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording. Is there anything else you want to say? No, I don't think so, except thank you. And I really look forward to seeing the, the book and the publication date is July. Um, I don't have a publication date yet. Oh, We're going okay. through. So, yeah. So I think it's a three month process. So okay. I think June, July is when it should be coming out. Oh, okay. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. And thank you so much for doing the interview and, and giving all us female playwrights a chance. Thank you. Uh, at being seen and read. So, yes. Okay. Take care. <laughs>